A war is being fought in the jungles of the Congo. And the outcome will decide the future of Africa's most endangered wildlife. I'm Mark Vins. For the last seven years, I've filmed hundreds of extreme adventures in the name of conservation. But now, my team and I have come to one of the most dangerous places on Earth to get face to face with the world's most legendary silverback gorilla. A mission that's taken us to the front lines of a deadly conflict. Right now, we are in Eastern Congo on our way to Virunga National Park. This road that we're on is called the RN2, just notorious for being one of the most dangerous roads in all of Africa, therefore making this drive one of the most dangerous in the entire world. Decades of civil war, an Ebola outbreak, and a recent volcanic eruption have given rise to terrorist organizations and armed rebel militias. They've been robbing people, kidnapping for ransom, and yes, shooting and killing civilians all the time. In fact, earlier this year, the Italian ambassador to the Congo was killed on this same road. So I brought an elite camera team with me to the DRC to investigate how these same criminals are destroying Virunga National Park and threatening the last remaining mountain gorillas on the planet. And make no mistake about it, a film crew out here is a prime target and we definitely stand out. If a spotter sees us on the side of the road and phones ahead, the rebel militias could stop us and we're sitting ducks. The only thing keeping us safe on this road are those rangers in that vehicle. The story we're about to show you is in my opinion, the most important story in world conservation right now. And by the end of it, you too will understand how you can play a critical role in this mission. All right, we made it to Kaboomba. We're here. Because the area surrounding the park is largely controlled by rebels and their activity intensifies at night, even Kaboomba, our base camp within the park, falls under strict lockdown and armed guards patrol the grounds 24-7. At first light, we gear up and prepare to ascend the mountain. We'll need to bushwhack our way through dense jungle to search for signs of gorillas. But to be clear, where we're going, there are no fences or safeguards. This is the domain of the largest and most dominant silverback in the Congo. We're led by Papa Diddy and Papa Augustine, two of the highest ranking rangers in Virunga. This is an armed ranger detail because we could potentially run into militant groups, but more likely so, we could run into poachers. And that's one of the main threats to this very fragile population of mountain gorillas. Are you ever scared to do this job? Very, very risky now mm. because of presence of, of many rebels, you see. But you do it because- I love gorillas. I have to say, okay, if I die, I die. And uh, um, um, if the, the gorillas are safe, okay. As we advance, we encounter our first test proving some obstacles are more menacing than they might appear. So this is a huge ant nest. They call them red ants out here. Uh, they look a lot like a leaf cutter ant. Big, big nest. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, see that? Ah, yeah, he's biting me. Ah. Yeah, check that. Pop two holes. Ah, they're all up inside my boots. Ah, my gosh. Woo, ow. Oh, okay. Clearly, wildlife encounters can be unpredictable. That's why it's so important to have rangers like Papa Diddy, with over 30 years of experience under his belt, lead us into the gorilla sector. They are wild animals, 
the silverback can believe that you want to catch a, a baby mm -hmm. or to catch a female. If the gorilla charge, he do this. Don't try to run. Take a sitting position. Look down. When I approach them, I do. Uh, mm. uh, mm. To tell them that don't be worried and to try to quiet them. Uh, mm. Yeah. As we trek deeper into the forest, it gets thicker. But eventually, we find our first evidence that we're closing in on the gorillas. This is a nest where the family has slept last night. The gorillas build a new nest every single day because nobody wants to come home to a dirty pile like that. What you're looking at is a key component to the forest survival. Gorillas are a keystone species responsible for seed distribution through piles like this. If you come down here, this is a silverback's nest. If you look carefully, you can find uh, silver hair. Oh. Look at that. You could see the size of the sprawl. This was not the work of a small gorilla. This was the work of a very, very big primate. As we close in, I'm reminded that we're exposed. There will be no barriers between us and the gorillas. And because we share nearly 99% of our DNA with them, we can also share illness and disease. So we mask up as a precaution. Okay, we just heard a gorilla right around this bend here. This is it, this is the moment we have traveled so incredibly far for, not only to the Congo and up this mountainside, but seven years of adventures have led me to this. There's a gorilla approaching us. It's right here. My hands are shaking. My heart is beating out of my chest. Oh my gosh. Is that serious? Are we safe? Oh my gosh, Jesus, you film that, film that. Film his face. Oh my gosh. Okay, that was insane. The two silverbacks and his family were fighting for dominance, and you could see where there's actually battle damage. The subdominant silverback is bleeding from the face. <laughs> That was definitely not what I expected for our first gorilla encounter. Despite the fact I've been told gorillas can be aggressively territorial. It's a baby gorilla. And will viciously protect their families if provoked. Mark it around, Mark it around. Silverback gorilla. Look at the size of the bite on his neck. The only thing that's going to give a silverback that big, a gash like that, is a fight with the dominant male. That tells me this is not the silverback we're looking for. And staring at that wound, I have to ask myself, do I really want to meet the animal that did that? Despite my fear ringing the alarm bell to turn back, we press on and find ourselves in the middle of something I've never seen documented. It's a bit of a gorilla feeding frenzy. They found a banana tree and they're literally ripping off the inside of the plant and eating it from beneath. Gorillas are almost entirely herbivores. And during the dry season, they binge on wild banana trees for sustenance and hydration. A feast like this is extremely rare to witness. 
Making it this far into the family unit has me wondering. Is the dominant silverback still in the distance? Or could he be watching us from just behind the brush? Miles away from camp, in the middle of the gorilla sector, any step, any move, anything can happen, including coming face to face with the king of this jungle. He's bugging, Mark. This is the, the, the dominant male. The dominant male here in the family. Uh, mm. He's okay with us being here. Yeah, he's like okay. He's the father of the largest family of gorillas here in Barunga National Park. 44 gorillas in his family. This is the biggest gorilla in the Congo. As the dominant male in his family, Begeni calls the shots. He's responsible for determining where the family travels, choosing its daily activities, and fathering the vast majority of the offspring. Must weigh over 400 pounds. He's a handsome silverback and he knows it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would estimate Bikini's hand is at least five to eight times bigger than my hand. Look at those teeth. Did you see those teeth? Mountain gorillas are a subspecies of eastern gorilla. And because they live in high elevations and experience freezing temperatures, they possess longer hair, making them distinct from all other gorilla species. You can see them thinking observing us. I'm just completely in awe. Look at the way that they're bonding, caring for each other, nurturing one another, and their curiosity of us is undeniable. It's like looking in a mirror. So how many gorillas are around? Maybe stretch can be around 30 gorillas. What we're witnessing is progress. Decades of poaching and habitat destruction brought the mountain gorilla population down below 400 individuals. But in recent years, they've crested back to over 1,000, proving the conservation efforts led by Virunga's rangers are working. However, the gorillas still remain an endangered species, and their future remains uncertain. Oh, wow. I don't know if you call that a wildlife encounter. It's almost like looking through time, like our, our ancestry, being in their family. They weren't animals to me in that moment. It was an unmistakably human experience. Um, wow. Encountering gorillas in the wild was, to say the least, life-changing. But our mission is far from over. Virunga National Park spans more than 3,000 square miles and is home to over 50% of the animal species on the continent. It's also Africa's oldest national park and part of the second largest rainforest on Earth, making the lungs of Africa a critical battleground in the fight against climate change. Unfortunately, protecting gorillas is only one of the battles. Criminal factions are poaching wildlife and burning the forest at breakneck speed. 
and their actions are affecting all of us. As I begin to understand this firsthand, I'm compelled to go deeper into the heart of the conflict, even if it means going behind enemy lines. There are militia units below us, and they're hostile to the park, so they would fire at us. Are we safe being up here in this airplane? If we're over 2,000 feet, um, the bullets, they don't even penetrate the skin. Emmanuel de Marode is the director of Virunga National Park. Having served for over 30 years, he now commands the Ranger Battalion that defends it. And right now, he's flying us up to Lake Edward, one of the most conflicted front lines of conservation in all of Africa. For years, it's been a victim of mass poaching and a prime target for illegal mining activity. We're starting to get into much more of a militia controlled area here. Up to about here, um, it's the FDLR militias, and then further north, it's these Mai Mai Congolese militias, who historically have been very, very violent. How often are your rangers being confronted with these militia rebels? Typically two or three um, confrontations every week, so it's every, every, every few week. days, yeah. Over 200 rangers have lost their lives in clashes with militias. In fact, just four months prior to our arrival, half a dozen rangers were gunned down by rebel forces. Yet despite the frequency of the brazen attacks in this area, it's where we must go if we want to understand the causes that undermine the foundation of the park. And to see the impact of those threats on the wildlife, we'll need to get within striking distance of Africa's deadliest animal. Lake Edward's 900 square mile body of water and its fish sustain hundreds of thousands of people. And the linchpin for all of it is the hippopotamus. In order to get a closer look at one of the last pods of hippos left in Eastern Congo, we must leave the safety of our boat and set out on foot. Wow, look at that. That's a lot of hippos. Yeah. Although they appear slow and at times even docile, Hippos are the most dangerous animal on the continent. Responsible for more human deaths than any other mammal. Check that out. They're staring right at us. This is probably about as close as we want to get. You, you wouldn't want to get into the water with them. Lake Edward was once home to the largest population of hippos in the world. At one point, over 27,000 of them roamed these waters. But by the 1990s, poaching took their numbers all the way down to less than 350 individuals. As another keystone species, hippos play a critical role in this freshwater environment by providing essential nutrients to the lake and its fish. In turn, they help sustain communities surrounding Lake Edward. Without them, locals will suffer and the lake will eventually die. So we lost almost 99% of all the hippos. Hippos are killed for their meat. One hippo will fetch three or $400 on the local market. It's, that's a huge amount of money for the militias. Anyone who's got a gun can suddenly make a lot of money. For the last 10 years, we've been really working on trying to protect these populations, but um, still a long way to go. So if you could boil it down, the short-term gains of poaching are leading to potentially long-term detriment yeah. for the communities that live around the park. But if we don't find a solution, there is no future for this park. What's needed is change. The change Emmanuel hopes to see comes with a cost. In his 30 years at Virunga, he's faced many obstacles including a hostile takeover of the park and clashes with the militants themselves, one of which included an assassination attempt. In 2014, I was in an ambush. As I was getting out of the vehicle, I got hit in the chest and then almost immediately after in the stomach by an AK-47, my rifle. And then some people from the village came and they, they put me on the back of a motorbike and basically saved, saved my life. When you got through that, did you find that your resolve was stronger? It, it makes you um, want to succeed. And 
you know, there's been such an enormous sacrifice on the part of Ferengas Rangers that we have to succeed. It was a, a terrible attack just, um, just over this area we're just crossing now. When it comes to the rebel groups and the militias, why did they choose Virunga? Why are they here? You know, it's the civil war in Congo, then the Rwandan genocide that brought them here. Um, but what's kept them here is the illegal trafficking of natural resources in the east of Congo, in particular Virunga National Park. So there you see, you'll see some charcoal burning. Yep. It's the guerrilla sector. It's under enormous threat from the clearing of forest. There are thousands of acres of forest that have been cleared for charcoal, and it's really the main source of revenue for those militias. Rebel groups and armed militias have pillaged Virunga. By burning trees and turning them into charcoal, they've created a $40 million a year black market that preys upon basic human needs, like boiling water and cooking food. This situation continues to drive the illegal logging that has led to a tipping point. If the damage they've done isn't reversed soon, the park has very little chance of survival. What can be done to solve these problems? What we desperately need is clean energy, renewable energy, not oil and not charcoal. And where is this renewable energy solution taking place? Well, let me show you. Emmanuel brings me to Metebe, home to a run of river hydroelectric plant in the heart of Virunga. It's powered by the Rachuru River, which flows from Lake Edward and generates 14 megawatts of electricity. Enough energy for over a million and a half residents in nearby Goma. Since there's no dam, there's minimal disruption to the natural ecosystem, making this plant a truly green source of energy. We're hoping in the next eight years to create eight power plants like this to generate 105 megawatts. That is enough power to create between 80 and 100,000 jobs. Enough to draw out all the young men and women from the militias and work on a whole new instrument for bringing stability to the region. Between here and there, that 105 megawatt goal, what can people do at home to help Virunga? Well, what we need more than anything really is support for the rangers on the ground because they're doing the critical work of keeping you know, that precious asset, which is the national park. If we can't keep the park alive, all of this disappears. So you truly have light at the end of the tunnel. What you need essentially is time to build this. Yeah, to that we place. just got to hold it together for another eight years. And then we have this extraordinary national park um, that is good for generations to come. As our adventure in the Congo comes to a close, we're all left amazed by the incredible journey we just experienced. But we realize our work to help the rangers of Virunga has only just begun. I came to the Congo expecting to find danger and desperation. However, what I found was hope for a brighter future, but it's by no means guaranteed. The challenges here are very real and the stakes couldn't be higher. For far too long, we've left the poorest people in the world to solve this problem alone. So what can we do? First, we can tell our friends and family about this story. By sharing this video, we can raise global support for Virunga. Spreading awareness is a simple way we can all be part of this solution. Second, we can buy the Virunga Rangers the one thing they need more than anything else, time. Eight to 10 years. That's what it's going to take until the majority of this region has easy access to electricity and the demand for charcoal and poaching of wildlife for profit is all but eradicated. Until then, Virunga's rangers will continue to have targets on their backs as they tirelessly defend against the factions who decimate its forests and brutally hunt its animals to extinction. But the ranger program and the very lives of each and every ranger hangs by the thinnest of threads. Instability in the region has crippled the flow of funding to the ranger program and without it, neither the rangers or the park stand a chance. Without the funding they need to continue their work, the ranger program goes away. And without them, the park and its wildlife will be destroyed. If that happens, 
Millions of people in this region will face starvation, and the planet will lose one of its most valuable weapons in the fight against climate change. That's why we're partnering with Rewild.org and its founding board member, Leonardo DiCaprio, as well as another very special supporter. Hello, I'm Jane Goodall, and I'm joining Brave Wilderness and Rewild.org in calling attention to this urgent issue. It's imperative that we all come together and take action by giving to Virunga's Ranger program and sharing this story. It costs just $16 to keep a ranger in the field for a day. By donating, you can help keep Virunga's Ranger program alive. The work that the rangers do to preserve the park is essential, not only for the wildlife, but also for everyone that lives there. Every dollar counts, and 100% of the money you give will go directly to Rewild for Virunga's Ranger program. And if you're unable to give, then please join us by sharing this video far and wide. The time is now, and the power to make change is in your hands. We can help save Africa's oldest national park and its endangered mountain gorillas. And to kick things off, Brave Wilderness is donating 2,000 ranger days to Barunga. So donate to rewild.org and join us in supporting these brave men and women that risk their lives every single day. All right, big day for Brave Wilderness. I'm about to attempt to film the real life Godzilla on the shores of an active volcano in the middle of the Galapagos. But to do that, I will need to dive under those crashing waves if I want to get up close to the only lizard on the planet that navigates the ocean, the marine iguana. Hostile forces of nature. The famous words of Darwin describe the Galapagos perfectly, and that's exactly what we're up against. Filming marine iguanas in action means we will need to scuba dive through shark-filled waters, avoid ripping ocean currents, and brave relentless tidal surges that will throw us around like ragdolls. All right, so as we make our way to the intertidal zone, you can begin to see what we're going to contend with. As a scuba diver, if we get caught in these breakers, it could be game over, but it's what it's gonna take if we wanna get up close to those iconic marine iguanas. All right, we have to dive deep quickly to avoid the current. All divers on today's mission are carrying emergency GPS beacons in case one of us gets pulled out to sea. It's critical we remain close together as we make our way toward the iguana feeding grounds. Visibility will change frequently, and there will be many twists and turns to navigate. The water here is very cold, only 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also high in nutrients, which attracts more than just iguanas. The Galapagos has one of the most biodiverse marine systems on the planet, making it a critical front line of conservation. But there's no time to waste. We need to save as much air as possible to film the iguanas. The surge will only get stronger the shallower we go. It's almost like the ocean is breathing. Push, calm, pull. Push, calm, pull. This is the most turbulent water I have ever experienced, and it's making it hard to stay submerged. But surfacing now could roll us into the breaking waves, which would be very dangerous and potentially a life-threatening scenario. Only 50 yards from shore, this is where we need to be. And there it is, our first iguana. What you are looking at is one of the most specialized lizards on the planet, and the only one that spends time in the ocean. The marine iguana. If there were ever a living version of Godzilla, this is it. In fact, one of the common names for them on San Cristobal Island is the Godzilla Iguana. Check out that scientific name. It turns out Godzilla is now a real animal. Filming these iguanas is going to be a real test. Luckily, the rocks down here are only covered in plants. So unlike coral, 
it's okay for us to carefully hold on with our gloves. But the surge is intense, making it nearly impossible to hold on when it rips through. Periods of calm will be our only chance to get close to the iguanas. But make no mistake, the surge will return. Luckily, the iguanas seem laser focused on feeding, almost ignoring our presence. Clearly, every bite counts when you're braving these conditions. Marine iguanas are herbivores that have adapted many specializations to help them survive at sea for the sole purpose of finding food. The rocks here are covered in a leafy marine salad that includes red and green algae, a favorite of the marine iguana, and one of the only reliable food sources for them in the Galapagos. To get it, they have to sometimes dive 60 feet and hold their breath for up to 30 minutes. They use their hooked, talon-like claws to grip onto the rocks, while their shortened snout allows them to get their teeth closer and into tight spaces to chop away at the algae. So their Godzilla-like appearance does serve a survival purpose. Marine iguanas have also developed flattened tails that are muscular and help them swim through this hazardous environment. And as much as they need their swimming ability to dive into the ocean, it's the getting back to land when it really comes into play. Unlike us, the iguanas are able to swim right into the breakers and body surf their way back to land. Their ability to navigate the bone-crushing waves is unbelievable. But of course, they saved their final and most impressive adaptation for the shore. Because these iguanas feed on plants full of salt water, they have remarkably evolved glands that absorb the salt to be ejected by way of snot rockets, also called wigs, and while it seems gross, it's very efficient and just another unlikely demonstration of how these iguanas have solved the many problems to exist here in the Galapagos. Contrary to their name, marine iguanas spend most of their lives on land. The shores of Fernadina can be stacked with hundreds of basking lizards, and while only adult iguanas dive for food, you can spot sub-adults and juveniles foraging in the tide pools or just at the water's edge. Large male iguanas are very territorial and can be seen sparring or using head bobs to push off competing males from the rest of the breeding population. Before they branched off to explore the waters of the intertidal zone, marine iguanas started as a land-based species, only driven below the ocean surface due to what must have been an extreme lack of food. In fact, in the Galapagos today, there are three distinct species of iguana that are all descendants of a common land ancestor, one of which is the rarest lizard on the planet and the one that brought us to the Galapagos in the first place. The interconnection between land and sea is unmistakable in the Galapagos. And as an ambassador for rewild.org, we are working together with the Galapagos National Park to ensure this marine reserve is expanded and remains protected for generations to come. There is no better example to the importance of these two worlds than the marine iguana, which is unique to the Galapagos and the only lizard on Earth that has adapted for life in the ocean.
the fact they have evolved to survive these hostile forces of nature is truly incredible. Oh, that was such a fun dive. That was the coolest scuba diving I've ever done in my entire life. Took everything we had to stay in position and to roll with the surge back and forth. It was surreal. It was like living inside the cover of a National Geographic magazine. Deep in the mountains of Chile, there is an insect so rare and so elusive that its sting is completely undocumented by science. And that sting belongs to the panda ant. And today, we're going to try to make history by being the first to find this panda ant, capture it on video, then of course I will take on the sting of the panda ant in a world's first. This is gonna be like looking for a fuzzy needle in a giant wilderness haystack. It's time to get searching. Now this won't be your average hike. Only a few panda ants have been found in the wild, so we're going to have to search this entire mountain range to even have a chance at finding them. Okay, this looks promising. This open area has a lot of sandy, loose material, which is perfect for the panda ant because it likes to make burrows. And it also allows us to cover a lot of ground fast. Covering ground, that is the name of the game when you're looking for very, very small creatures. The more ground your eyes can scan, the more likely it is you'll find what you're looking for. We're hearing water down below. In the desert, water is life. Let's try our luck in a different environment. Found the water. Ah, it looks so good. If you were ever stuck out here in the desert, this water would be absolutely life-saving and perfectly fine to drink running this fast. A little bouldering. Just seeing water is a boost of energy. Oh, I feel so good. Oh. Oh. It's good that we're seeing these flowers. Panda ants feed on a diet predominantly of nectar. So these flowers, good indication we have a food source. There's definitely more life down by this river. Finally feels like we're starting to close in on the panda ant. Seeing these smaller wasps, that makes me feel really positive. I think the trail is heating up. I'm starting to see yellow jackets. Good sign for us right now. This is the insect watering hole. But look at that one. See that one that's chasing the others off? It's got like a panda-like abdomen. You seeing this? Abdomen, you seeing this? The male panda ants have wings. Let's keep moving. Have to be getting close. Oh, whoa, look at all these. Just got to this trail and there are all these burrows. I can't say whether or not these are definitively panda ant burrows, but they're the right size and right shape and in the right place. Finally feels like we're starting to close in on the panda ant. Panda ant right there. Ho oh, oh, ho oh! ho! Woo! We got one! Holy ho! Oh. We were literally just about to give up. It's not a big one, but that is a panda ant, baby. Let's go. Yes. Oh. Got one. But our luck wouldn't end there. As we prepped our presentation and captured the first ever video of this fuzzy little panda, something even more incredible happened. Got another one. Hold on, hold on. Get in there, get in there. Go. They're so fast. So fast. This one's kind of small. I don't want to get stunned. Not, uh, not yet, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Two panda ants. Holy cow. And this one really looks like a panda. Wow. Not one, but two panda ants. This is such a rare opportunity to film this world famous creature. There is almost no footage of this species. In fact, this is likely the first 4K footage the world has seen of the panda ant, the world's smallest panda. The 
the first thing I noticed about these creatures were their size. They are teeny tiny. Look at the little capsules that we had to bring with us for this presentation. But not only are they small, they are fast. I cannot believe we actually were able to get them into the containers. It's not likely that we're gonna be able to get very much B-roll of them walking around. All it would take is a small little hole or crack in the ground and they are poof, gone. They got their name the Panda Ant because of that black and white fuzzy exoskeleton, which of course I keep calling them an ant, but they are not an ant at all. They are a species of wasp and the wingless ones are actually females. The males of this species have wings, but the females do not possess wings. But what they do possess is the largest stinger to body size ratio of any insect in the world. They're related to the cow killer found in the Southern United States, another species famous for its massive stinger and painful sting. Both have fuzzy exoskeletons and are classified as velvet ants. However, unlike the cow killer, the effects of the panda ant venom are completely unknown. And with that, it's time to take a closer look at their defense mechanisms. They don't just look like pandas for our amusement. They've developed this coloration to ward off predators to say, hey, I pack a punch. I have a lot of defenses and you will regret it. Now let's talk about another defense mechanism. Let's bring the microphone in there real close. You hear that? That's called stridulation, which is a high frequency warning pitch that these insects are able to emit. And we're not just boosting the sound. This insect's actually noisy. I can hear it. Look at that. Swinging the abdomen already. Might get to see an appearance of that. Oh, that stinger's coming out. Compared to body size, that is a super long stinger. It will have no problem popping a stinger through my skin. Now, remember when I said earlier, this is probably the first 4K footage of a panda ant. Let me also tell you, this is about to be the first ever documented sting of this species. No one has taken the sting of the panda ant. Going into the sting zone with the panda ant is truly the great unknown. I have no idea what kind of reaction I'm going to have. So we brought a couple of emergency remedies. Of course, our satellite phone. If I go into any kind of anaphylactic shock, we will use this for emergency distress calls. In addition to that, I always bring a first aid trauma kit. And in this trauma kit, I always have an EpiPen. That's pretty much our only remedies if this sting gets really bad. For the first time ever, it's time to go flush the stinger with the panda ant. That stinger is flying. That is a very big stinger. I would say the stinger is the entire length of the lower abdomen. All right, it is time. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the panda ant. Here we go to the great unknown of the world of stings. One, two, three. Ah. Yep, stinger's in, stinger's in. Ah. Ah. Oh, I dropped her. Where'd she go? Oh, it's here. Definitely stung me. Uh, maybe under the wall? Yeah, let me see. Uh, they're so fast. And they blend in perfectly where she can't have gotten far. Look around. Yeah, I'm gonna look over here. All right, yeah, yeah, keep looking, keep looking. Oh no! Oh! Uh, well. Unfortunately, I dropped the ant. She definitely gave me a sting before hightailing it out of here. We've got two distinct sting marks. I would say it's probably similar to that of a hornet, but luckily for us, we have one more ant. In fact, this is the one that looks most like a panda. So, it's time to see if the world's smallest panda packs a potent punch. Gotta get a good grip. I know it looks easy, but it is so hard to get a good grip on these tiny little hand ants. There we go. Okay, stinger's going. One, two, three. Ah! Ooh, yeah, okay. Definitely took a really good sting and a bite. See this panda's jaws locked into me? Ah, I think this panda ant's bite is worse than its sting. Ah, definitely getting little micro stings. Tiny panda ant just might not be big enough to deliver a full punch. <sighs> okay. Well, you can see here, I got two really good stings 
from the ant that got away. And then I probably have, I don't know, like a dozen little micro stings. I left it there for a while, but there were there was one or two really good ones. Oh my God, there it is. Got it. We just found the first panda ant. Wow, I cannot believe it. What am I supposed to do with you? You ran away and now you're back. Should we try to get like another wallop? All right, well, gonna go for another sting. I don't know if I got a full one that first time around. On three. One, two, three. Ah, yep, got me. Ah, bite me. Ah, and stinging me. Got a good one there. Ah. Okay, yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. Really not a remarkable sting, even though we're getting a lot of redness and little micro swelling around those sting sites. This might have been the world's cutest sting. The sting of the tiny panda ant is no match for its growl. All right, let's let this little panda back into the wild. While the pain was manageable right after the sting, the secondary reaction roared back the next day, where I had redness, swelling, and a relentless itch. So while the panda ant might be cute, the sting of this tiny insect should definitely be avoided. Hey guys, Mario Aldecoa here. And I'm Mark Vins, and welcome to a very special adventure sponsored by our friends at b &H Photo. Mario, what are we doing out here in the middle of the jungle at night? Well, we're gonna do one of our favorite hobbies called night herping. Night herping, well, I know what that means, but I think some people at home might need a little explanation. Night herping very simply is searching for reptiles and amphibians. Actually, we're here at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Center, one of our favorite locations to search for species in the tropics. That's right. In fact, we've filmed over 40 of our most famous YouTube videos right here mm -hmm. at this location. So needless to say, this place is jam-packed with wildlife, and we thought, hey, let's see just how many animals we can find on a single adventure. And along the way, we might talk about some of the tips and tricks of the trade and how we film animals at night. I'm ready if you're ready. I'm ready. Let's get out there. Starting the adventure. Mario, is this uh, kind of the point of the evening where you start to get, uh, I don't know, a little excited about what you're gonna see? Yeah, as soon as I put the headlamp on and I've got my trusty snake hook in my hand, I am excited and ready to go. So what are you looking for, Mario? Like, what's, what's an indicator of an animal? I just kind of scan slowly as I'm walking, and what you're trying to do is find any difference in texture, color, uh, and contrast, and of course, movement. If something moves, it's probably an animal. And that's your biggest indication that you found something. All right, so we have our first amphibian. It's actually called a dirt frog, probably because of its coloration. Check this little guy out. Oh! oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> He's talking to me. And I'm gonna let you go. You're cute. Oh! <laughs> All right, check this guy out. That is a stick insect, or a stick bug. If I didn't actually see it move, I would have probably thought it was. Uh oh, it's a, it's a runaway. I oh, almost got him here. Well, where's that? You got him. You got him. I love these. These are one of my favorites. Let's release them right here. So when you're out searching at night, usually you expect to find nocturnal species, but sometimes you actually will find some diurnal species. And of course, when they're out at night, they're usually sleeping. A very common species you encounter are anoles. That's clearly sleeping. He's kind of splayed out on the vegetation. All right, let's continue. Oh, there's a giant cockroach. What? Let me see if I can get it. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, oh, oh no, I missed it. Oh, here it is. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Oh man, dude. Do you want to see what's on your neck? Ready, put out your hand. Oh. <laughs> that is a really big roach. You know what kind of roach that is? No, a big roach. Papa roach? Papa roach. <laughs> this is the papa roach of roaches. And that is a leaf frog. Yeah, oh, look at that little guy. The leaf frogs have the distinct, really large eyes. All right, moving on. Check this out. It may not look like much, or actually it may look like a giant booger attached to this leaf. This gelatinous goo is the developing embryos of a frog species. 
they actually attach the eggs to the bottom of leaves and the leaves are overhanging on streams. As the embryos develop, the little tadpoles will fall down into the stream and continue their metamorphosis into an adult frog. It's amazing because you can actually see the little embryos moving around. All right, look what we have here. Our first snake of the night. The very elegant cat-eyed snake. This is a juvenile. It is an arboreal species, long and slender. So cat-eyed snake has elliptical pupils as a lot of the nocturnal species out here have during the day. If you were to look at its eye, it would be that nice kind of cat-eyed uh, feature or look. So that was our first snake of the night. Uh, we're gonna continue and see if we could find something bigger. Even the scorpions are arboreal here. Oh, cool, check this out. What'd you find? Katie did. Oh yeah. Kind of looks like it's covered in moss. Now there's a lot of variations of the Katie did in a lot of species and depending on their environment, they can blend in very well, super cryptic. Look at this. This is a really unique lizard species to the tropics. It's called a cask-headed lizard. The name cask implies that right there. So this family of lizards has this big crest on their head and neck area. The tactic that this lizard is employing right now is basically using its cryptic color and lying motionless. Uh, it's just pretending to be part of this branch and hoping that we don't actually touch it or catch it, which we won't. We're gonna leave it be so it could rest uh, and have a good night. All right, we got a fertile lance. Oh, yes. Look at this snake. That is a good one. That is a good size fertile lance. All right, let's approach very slow. See, oh, no, it's moving. That is a big, big venomous snake. Easy, Mario. Take your time, buddy. We just want to actually get it under control. Easy, Mario. Easy, easy. Relax, back, relax. Back. He's fast, guys. He's fast. He's really fast. Oh, oh, Trent. He almost lost Trent. You all right, buddy? I'm good. He almost, Trent almost found, fell down this ravine, guys. Yeah. All right, Mar Mario, so why are we bagging the snake? All right, we're basically bagging the snake because we have to take it to a more controlled situation. It's an it's a extremely dangerous snake, so we don't want to be handling this snake in a tight trail uh, like the one we're on, where basically one misstep and you're either off or the snake gets you because you have nowhere to go. So what we want to do is uh, safely take this to a location where we can present it uh, in a more open area. All right, let's go. Ready? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> let's go ahead and fire up our light kit here. These lights by light and motion are absolutely awesome. These are the Stella Pros. Uh, I'm gonna boost them up to full power to start, 8,000 lumens a piece. The way I know that is they have this nice little LED panel in the back, it tells you the power and the estimated time remaining for the charge of the battery. So we're gonna go down to 5,000. Lights are really important for obvious reasons when you're filming at night. Not only does it expose the scene for your cameras, but it also keeps us safe. Whenever you're working with a dangerous animal like a fair to lance, you want to know what your footing's like. You want to know if there's any other animals around or anything that could distract the presenter or the camera operators. We're going to do a cross pattern tonight. We're going to start with one light out here on the right-hand side, and then we're going to put another light out here on the left-hand side. These are awesome because they're small, compact, lightweight. We've got these Manfrotto tripods. This whole kit can break down, fit right in the backpack that I'm wearing with ease. Got a quick release even, like right here, if I want to take the light off and we want to move it for a different shot. If you're going to be shooting at night, definitely invest in a good, rugged, mobile light kit. Yeah, buddy. That was a little bit intense, or a lot intense, actually. We were in a very precarious situation. A venomous snake and a very tight, narrow pathway with basically a steep hill on one side and a ravine on the other and one false step, you're going down, just like Trent did. We almost lost Trent. We almost lost Trent. We decided to bag the snake safely and find an area that was open. The key is to have an area you feel comfortable handling this dangerous animal so that the animal is safe and that we are safe. And I think this is gonna be our best spot. Believe it or not, when the snake is in a bag, it is still just as dangerous. In fact, many people are bitten through snake bags. 
So the thought is, well, the snake is in there, it can't see you, and you're gonna place your hand somewhere. Well, the snake does have heat-seeking pits, and they also respond to movement. So anything that touches the bag, they might actually strike out and envenomate you right through the bag. So Mario, I don't wanna add any pressure to the situation, but I think it's important for everyone at home to know just how dangerous is this snake. The Fertilance is one of the most dangerous snakes here in the tropics. It is responsible for actually 90% of all venomous snake bites. Now the reason for this is because these are very common species. And because these snakes are common, people encounter them on a regular basis. Now the reason why they bite so many people is not because they're super aggressive snakes going out of their way to actually attack a person. Oh, you just bit the snake You just bit the snake hook. Did yeah. you see that? Yeah, I did. What does that mean, Mario? Well, that means the snake's a little upset. So what you just saw there was a snake bit the hook. And that was a very deliberate bite. So let's actually just let it kind of calm down. This venom is a cocktail of some really nasty stuff. And the properties of that venom are basically myotoxins and cytotoxins that are going to destroy tissue. We are talking about necrosis. Often, the bite of a fertilance will require amputation of the limb or the area where the snake bit. Now, the snake is very cryptic in coloration. In fact, the name in Costa Rica for this snake is terciopelo, which actually means velvety skin. And that sheen that you see on the snake looks like velvet, but in fact, the snake scales are keeled. Its pattern and coloration allows it to cryptically camouflage against the leaf litter very well. And unfortunately, an unsuspecting person might walk and step on the animal. The animal will bite in defense. Now, the one thing to notice about the fertilance is it is a pit piper. So right between the eyes and the nostrils, there is an opening on the snake's head they're actually heat sensing pits that pick up on warm blooded animals. So if a snake like this were to bite one of us, the only thing to do is to get to medical attention as fast as possible. Uh, you do not want to put a tourniquet on a snake bite like this because it will actually restrict the venom and cause more necrosis potentially. Now the Fertilance is a snake you do not want to encounter and pick up like we are doing but it is not necessarily a snake that's gonna go after you. Like all snakes, its main goal is to get away and leave you alone. Well, how about that? The infamous Fertilance. The next step is to secure the animal and release it back where we found it. Well, here we are. This is the spot. That's the spot, Man, definitely. What an epic evening out here at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Center. Once again, found all kinds of animals. We found everything from frogs, to lizards, to insects, like that giant roach. That was creepy. And, of course, the superstar, the Fertilance. Right. What was that like? That Fertilance was pretty intense. A very dangerous snake, but a beautiful snake as well. So before we go, we do want to say a special thanks one more time to our friends at B&H Photo for sponsoring this adventure. And here's some more good news. For everybody at home right now, if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave, they have all kinds of exclusive gear packages and deals just for our fans. So go check that out, guys. Grab your own gear so you can start making your own videos just like the stuff that we use out here in the field. And don't forget, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can join us on our next adventure. I'm Mario Aldecoa. And I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, let's let go of that snake. That's all you, bud. Few places on our planet are as alive as the country of Ecuador. From its towering cloud forest, down to the Amazon basin, and all the way out to the islands of the Galapagos, this country stands as a pillar of hope for the entire natural world. And as part of the Non-Fungible Planet campaign to celebrate Earth Day, YouTube is sponsoring this video for an expedition into this pristine environment where we will get up close with some of its most magnificent and unusual wildlife. Joining us on this adventure will be Dr. Lena Valencia, a renowned conservation scientist and wildlife expert. Lena has spent years conducting field research throughout Latin America on many animal species, ranging from primates all the way down to amphibians. Lena knows this environment well, 
And with any luck, together, we will uncover brand new species never before seen on video. After crossing the ridges of the Andes and navigating down the slopes of the Amazon, we set out on foot to venture deep into the heart of the rainforest. Right away, I was struck by the immense beauty and diversity of this place. But right about the same time, we were also struck with the challenges in front of us. We trekked miles through the jungle, crossing rivers and braving rainstorms and mud to get to the edge of the primary forest. Here we waited for darkness, because while some creatures do make themselves present by day, the best and most interesting only roam under the cover of night. During the day, there are diurnal animals. That means daytime wildlife. But the best time to find all the cool creatures that call this rainforest home is at night. Well, you cannot come to the Amazon and not go night herping. Night herping. What is night herping? So we're going to turn our headlamps on, and then we're going to start walking through the forest to discover all the cool creatures that we're going to see tonight. Frogs, snakes, really cool insects. Awesome. Well, I know I'm excited. This is our first trip to Ecuador for Brave Wilderness. You've been here a few times, so yeah. I'm going to let you lead the way. Let's turn our flashlights on and head off into the rainforest. That's the biggest one I have ever seen, Lena. It is strong. It is like taking all my finger strength just to hold on to it. Look at those legs kick away. Now, I would attempt to let it rest on my hand if it weren't for those massive mandibles in the front. It will absolutely slice your skin open like a razor sharp knife. Make no mistake about it, these katydids are fierce. And if you've seen all the leaves around here that have holes in them, see all these holes? That's due to these creatures just munching away, eating the plant leaves, hole by hole, leaf by leaf. Wow. With over 6,400 species, Katie did come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And while they are called the longhorn grasshopper, they are actually more closely related to crickets, including this giant leaf Katie did. And you can see the camouflage. Here, let's hold it up to a leaf right here. Look at how well it blends in with the leaves here. Absolutely superior camouflage. I mean, Lena, that, that's a leaf. It's, it's you, you, like it has even the veins that a leaf would normally have. Yeah, oh, so it is so incredibly strong for an insect. Look at it, it's just ripping holes in the leaf as we're trying to take it off. Look at the abdomen pulsate underneath there. And this can fly. You wanna hold it, Lena? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay, well, let's get a couple more shots and then we're gonna put this monstrous Katie did right back on the leaf, which I found it. Wow. As exciting as it is to explore these environments, there are many potential hazards, like venomous snakes lurking on the ground, and spiny plants all the way up to the canopy. So proceeding with extreme caution is a must. All right, let's get the cameras in close. You see this? Lena just spotted this stick insect and it is super spiky. Here you go, Lena. Oh man, that can is so see, cool. Can you see all the spikes? Oh yeah. It's almost like a stick insect version of the thorny devil that we saw in Australia. Besides its incredible appearance, I'm already amazed by its three unique defense mechanisms. The first one's pretty obvious, stick insect, master of camouflage. Defense mechanism number two. Lena, why don't you tell us how spiky this stick insect is? Pretty, pretty spiky over here. That's right, I'm gonna try it. Ah, yeah. If you were to try to forcefully grab it, you would get a handful of spines and it would not feel good. Let's move on to the third defense mechanism. Look at how much that rear abdomen looks like the head of a snake, almost like a dragon. Look how it curls. Almost like a scorpion. 
That is a false head and is another defense mechanism. So a would-be predator would actually go after the wrong side of the insect, giving it one last chance of escape. More than 3,000 species of stick insect inhabit our planet. And to add a fourth defense to its arsenal, this spiny stick insect actually has the ability to produce a noxious odor that is impossible to ignore. You guys can't smell it, but yeah. there's a very strong smell. Yeah, it smells almost like bug spray. I think that's the best way I could describe it. A very unique smell, not a smell I've ever encountered before. Wow, you never know what you're gonna see when you come out night herping in Ecuador, but I certainly never in my wildest dreams expected a creature like this. All right, Lena, great spot. Why don't you do the honors and put this one back on its leaf? Oh man, that's so cool. Scoot it back. Oh, look, there's a monkey tree frog here. Oh yeah. Can you wow. see it? It blends so well with the leaf. Yeah, they're called monkey tree frog because right now they're not moving, but when they move, they look like a monkey moving oh, okay. through, through the forest. Are they nocturnal? Yeah, they're nocturnal. And right now you think it, it's sleeping, but it's not. It's actually because it's sensor present, so they get still and they're like that defensive mechanism. And if I was to grab it, like they would like curl into and play dead. And that's how they defend from predators. Wow. Yeah, you can actually see, even since we walked up here, it's gotten a lot darker. Mm-hmm. So is there any way to show everyone what this defense Yeah. Is? Yeah, because I've heard about, I've actually never seen one of these. So can you see how it's crawling? That's like a defense mechanism when it's disturbed. Wow. Do you see, when it was in the tree, it was like not as cold as it is right now. So it's playing possum. Mm -hmm, it's playing dead. Yeah. And actually some of these frogs, when you touch them, they change color and release some toxins. Oh, really? As well, that if they're like, they won't be poisonous in my hand, but if like I put it on my eye, I will be struggling. After we placed the frog back on its leaf, we spotted another one on a nearby branch. So here's a much livelier perspective. Nice little leaf frog. Nice job, Lena, good spot. All right, let's keep moving. Among the maze of vines and other vegetation, we search slowly and carefully because many things in this jungle are not as obvious as they might appear. Whoa, what is this? Oh. Is that a toad? Yeah, that's actually a leaf toad. Can you tell why? <laughs> oh yeah, oh my goodness. Let's see if I can pick it up right on its leaf. Look and how it camouflages so well with the leaf. Yeah, you can definitely make out the paratoid glands and see the, uh, the bumps all over the surface of the skin. Definitely a toad. I'm speechless. <laughs> this is an unbelievable find. Have you seen one of these before, Lena? I've seen leaf toads before, but not particularly this one. I, I'm, I'm in awe. Look at how beautiful the eye is. While many species of amphibians utilize superior camouflage here in Ecuador, some of them are actually very toxic and display brilliant colorations, as is seen in poison dart frogs and the world's rarest and most colorful jewel of the rainforest, the harlequin toad. Hi. Thanks for hanging out with us. And, you know, I noticed that a lot of species out here in Latin America, they're not really flighty. They, they do rely on their defense mechanisms. For better or for worse, that's what they're going with. Yep. Not afraid of you because he will attack. <laughs> so there you have it. That is one super camouflaged but cool amphibian. And Lena, I think this is a great way to call it a wrap here of our exploration of Ecuador. Thank you so much for having You're us. You're most welcome. You've shown us so many cool animals. I hope everybody at home has appreciated this look into this beautiful ecosystem. I'm Mark Vins. I'm Lena Valencia. Be brave. Rewild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, ready to go back out? See you later. We'd like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Lena Valencia and NGOs like Rewild.org who make the conservation and sustainability of places like this their primary mission. And thank you again to you two for making this adventure possible and sponsoring this exciting exploration to celebrate the beauty and wonder of our planet. Exploring Ecuador was an absolute dream come true.
Which poison frog is more toxic? I got him. Coyote's not the only one who bleeds. What's going on everybody? I'm Mark Vins. Today we're back in Costa Rica for another special adventure brought to you by our friends at B&H Photo. And I'm particularly excited for today's adventure because we are looking for one of my all-time favorite land animals, the poison frog. And not just one poison frog, two poison frogs. The strawberry poison frog, and my personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. And the reason I wanna find and present these frogs to you today is because I wanna talk about just how toxic and dangerous these frogs really are and Mario is gonna give a special demonstration on how we get those really cool macro shots of a small creature like a poison frog. But first things first, we have to find some. Today we're gonna to search just around our lodge here because this whole site is full of bromeliad plants and those are perfect breeding habitats for these species of frogs. So they tend to hang out pretty close by. As a matter of fact, I hear one right now. I'm gonna film on the GoPro, you guys follow me, and with any luck, we're gonna catch two frogs really quickly. Okay, I think what I heard was actually the strawberry poison frog, also called the pomelio. And I heard it coming from right over here. Oh, there he was. I saw him right there. I'm gonna try to not disturb the habitat too much. Ah, this one might've gotten away. So the frogs do have burrows in these masses and they have really great escape routes. They're particularly hard to catch too because they jump with a non-rhythmic motion, which means uh, they don't really have any synchronization at all to the way they hop. That was our first miss, but we did see a strawberry poison frog there. Let's keep looking. We are in the right spot. So these frogs are terrestrial, so what we're looking for are low-hanging branches and leaves that they can find cover around, and that's typically where you find these poison frogs. Oh, got one, got one. There he is. Oh, I fell. Don't move, don't move, it's right here. I'm gonna let it work its way out. I'm gonna go for the grab. Ready, got a shot. Got him. Woo, ha <laughs> ha. All right. Ready for this? Here we go. Strawberry poison frog. We got one. All right, that's part one of two of today's adventure. Next up, the green and black poison frog, which is a little bit more difficult to catch than this one. So for now, let's, uh, let's get a container. Going to make a little micro habitat for this frog for a little bit. Some cover so it feels comfortable. There we go. All right, let's go find a green and black poison frog. All right. Good news, bad news. The good news is we caught the first frog we we're after today, the strawberry poison frog, and a really good one too. The bad news is we're in the rainforest and that means sometimes it's gonna rain. And there is a rainstorm coming in right now, so we're gonna let this shower pass by. There is a little blessing in disguise. This moisture is probably gonna bring out some of the frogs we're looking for. So all we have to do is wait a little while and then we'll be back at it trying to find the green and black poison frog. All right, taking a quick break. So the rainstorm has passed by, which is good news. Also good news because all of a sudden the rainforest has come to life. We're hearing tons of frogs calling right now. Can you hear that? I can hear about six or seven different species distinctively right now that I wasn't hearing before. So this is a really good sign that we may come across that green and black poison frog a little sooner than we thought. Now the call of the strawberry poison frog is a little more distinct and a little louder. It's like a rip, 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 rip kind of sound. The uh, Green and black poison frog is a duller kind of and it's definitely a lot less audible. So we're gonna have to listen as we search along this edge. So unlike the uh, strawberry poison frog, which I was able to sneak right up on and catch, the green and black poison frog is definitely more elusive and shy. So I'm gonna have to be looking a lot further ahead than the other species. I've actually never caught a green and black poison frog myself. So this is a pretty special day for me. This is my absolute favorite species of poison frog. I've been obsessed with these creatures since I was in third grade. Um, and this is really a dream come true to be out here today in Costa Rica, finally getting hands on with one of my favorite animals, if I'm lucky. Okay, nothing here. Let's keep moving this way. Wait a second. I heard one. It's gone. So faint, I heard it for just a second. Let's move over this way. There's one. Where? Big one, right there. It's right here. One. Yep. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it. I see it. Got him. 
<laughs> oh man, all right, I don't wanna lose them. Let's go back over here. This is a big deal. Oh my goodness. Oh, no. Got him, got him, got him, got him. Let's get away. Oh man, this is a big moment. My first ever green and black poison frog. Look at that. I have been dreaming of this moment since I was nine years old. Look at how beautiful that frog is. Now we have both poison frogs that we wanna take a closer look at today. Let's put this one in a container and take a look at both species side by side. Coyote's not the only one who bleeds. I bleed blood. That whole bush that I just caught the poison frog in is full of uh, spotty plants. Ouch. Woo, okay. Well, there we have it. Poison frog versus poison frog. We are gonna take a quick look at the differences between these two species before we get into the macro photography. So first things first, it's pretty obvious that we have a size difference here. The strawberry poison frog is more often than not a lot smaller than the green and black poison frog. We can also notice they have very distinct coloration differences. And I have to say, look at how beautiful these two poison frogs are. They truly are the jewels of the rainforest. Now, they don't just look this way to impress us. There's actually a reason why these frogs display the colorations that they do. This is what's called aposomatic coloration, which is a warning sign to predators that says, don't eat me, because if you do, you're gonna eat a whole mouthful of toxins that I have in my skin. Now, we're gonna get to how toxic these two creatures are in just a minute, but before we do, let's talk about a couple other differences in behavior. So they parent in very different ways. The strawberry poison frog, which genus is Ophega, which means egg eater, actually takes their tadpoles once they're hatched out of the egg deposit them in a small reservoir of water. This can be in a bromeliad plant, this can be in an empty coconut husk, this can be in a hollowed out log. And once the tadpoles are in there, the female will go and deposit unfertilized eggs to feed their offspring. And this is the primary food source for these tadpoles until they reach maturity and become frogs. With the green and black poison frog, their parenting is a little bit different. The male will actually carry the tadpoles on its back to a water reservoir like a bromeliad or a hollowed out log and they will deposit the tadpoles at different times. Now, because of this, the tadpoles have different stages of maturity, and while they are good parents, they're not the greatest brothers and sisters because these tadpoles, unfortunately, often cannibalize each other for resources because unlike the strawberry poison frog, which feeds on eggs from its parents, the green and black poison frog is completely reliant on its surroundings, so it's gonna eat other insect larvae, algae, and mites that might crawl around the surface. Time to answer the question you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the toxicity of these two poison frogs. Which one is more toxic? The short answer is, it's pretty hard to tell. But for human beings, both of these species are considered, get this, non-threatening. And that's exactly why I'm able to hold both of these and present them for you here today. All I need to do after this presentation is wash my hands with soap and water, and I'm going to be just fine. Now, that being said, there are varieties of poison frogs in South America that are potentially dangerous and even deadly to human beings. And we're actually gonna be going on a trip to Colombia later this year to try to find some of those. So while neither of these frogs are potentially threatening to human beings, they are both very toxic for their would-be predators. So I think we've taken a pretty good look at both of these little gems of the rainforest. And now it's time for Mario to step in and show us some of the cool tricks of the trade and how we get those awesome macro shots with some of our specialty lenses. Mario, you ready to step in? All right, let's do it. Okay, cool. Okay, so we had to make a quick move there because the sun started to come out. And uh, believe it or not, despite being toxic, these frogs are actually very, very fragile. So for the well-being of the frog, we wanted to move to the shade. And that being said, Mario, how do we get these macro shots? We're gonna be using this setup right here, which is the new Canon EOS R and our favorite lens, the macro 100 millimeter Canon L series. So in order to get these really tight shots, uh, a few things have to be in our favor, light and stability. So we like to use a nice sturdy tripod in order to get the stability we need in low light conditions. One of the reasons why we really love this 100 mil macro lens is because of its amazing image stabilization. A lot of times we may not have the most heavy duty tripod and we have to use lightweight gear. So that extra image stabilization is critical. So I'm gonna start recording. We've got this dual pixel autofocus, which means any little movement will actually be tracked. 
Now, unfortunately, there is some movement in just holding this animal. It is very hard to keep still. But as you can see, we're already achieving that really fine detail that macro photography actually will allow. So how am I doing? Am I staying steady enough for you? You're pretty steady, but I think we are done with this guy. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to the green and black. Okay, cool. Now time for the all-star. My personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. Man, nine-year-old Mark would be very, very pleased with how today's going. In, in the world of macro, uh, we went from the little strawberry dart frog to this one. Mm -hmm. This is bigger. So now I have to actually adjust a little bit, at least for the distance. Uh, we want to get kind of its entire body in frame. That blue shirt with this contrast of the green and black looks really nice. Thank you, Mario. I'll take that as a compliment. It's amazing you could actually see its respiration. Beautiful. So macro photography is definitely a team effort, especially in a situation like this where you have one person holding a specimen and one person getting the video. Great thing about these cameras, of course, is you could also get your still images from them. Okay, got both frogs back in hand. Mario, you ready to get the thumbnail? Yeah. And since this episode is a comparison of two of our favorite species of poison frog, we're gonna do a head-to-head -head comparison for the thumbnail. Let's, let's get a green background. Man, what an awesome day. Catching a strawberry poison frog is always a great day, but I have to say for myself, finding and catching my very first green and black poison frog was truly a special moment. So thank you for being here, Mario. That was Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. And I do want to say a special thank you to b h Photo for sponsoring this adventure. And here's some good news. They put together some awesome gear and deal packages just for our audience. So if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave right now, you can take advantage of those deal offerings and get outside and make videos like we do. Yeah, and don't forget, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can join us on our next adventure. All right, starting to rain. Better, yeah. better wrap it up. Let's get out of here. Yeah. I'm Mario Decoa. I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, let's let him go. Thanks for hanging out. All right, see you later. Hey everybody, I'm Mark Vins, and welcome back to another special adventure brought to you by B&H Photo. Tonight, we are going out in the jungle looking for a ghost. No, not a paranormal ghost, a living ghost, one that we will actually find if we can locate its habitat. This animal loves moving water. So in order to find out where we need to hike tonight, we need to use the light of day and our drone to see where the stream systems exist on this property. First things first, before we can fly the drone, we've got to set it up. And today we are flying the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. This is a really awesome drone, but for us today, it's more of a reconnaissance tool so we can see the area that we're gonna be adventuring in tonight. And lift off. All right, we are up in the sky. Oh man, you know what? There's like all kinds of clouds coming in right now. This actually looks gorgeous. Check that out. So glass frogs, an arboreal frog that lives up off the ground, love river systems because that's where they lay their eggs and develop their tadpoles. Now, if we can locate water, there's a pretty good chance that we could put ourselves there, and listen for the calls of the glass frog, and then locate the ghost glass frog. Okay, I'm gonna fly due east and we wanna mark the ridges and the approximate distance to get to these streams and rivers and hopefully get eyes on one of the streams that's closest to us as a starting point. And we wanna maybe sketch the shape and some distinct features sure. to help us get there. Okay. So you see the ridge right in front of us, that's, we'll call that ridge one. And there's definitely a secondary ridge over top of it. Okay. And this is the great part about scouting with the drone. You really can see the topography in an area like Costa Rica, which is very mountainous and hilly and just confusing at night. I mean, right, Mario, you can easily yeah. get turned around out there in the jungle, but by having a map at our aid, it's going to make tonight's expedition that much more efficient. This vegetation is dense. Even from the sky, it is difficult to see anything in those trees. That's water, got it. So you see the way that curves around? So yep. over Ridge 1, and then on the downside of Ridge 2, the stream comes from the south and goes just north and then bends back west. Yep. And then you see that cluster of rocks? Yep. I think that could be our uh, 
kind of landmark, maybe our entryway. Based on the fact that that was over 2,500 meters of flight, we're gonna estimate to, to get down here because of the terrain up and down, that's gonna be about another two kilometers. Okay. Three kilometers total in hiking tonight. Okay. And then you have a compass on your watch, which will really come in handy. Yep. So we've got the map. We know where the stream is at. All we gotta do is wait until it gets dark. And of course, bring that drone back. I hear it. There it is, yeah. So we did a manned launch, and right now we're going to do a catch landing. This is not for a novice drone pilot. Gotcha. All right. Well, that's a wrap on recon. Let's head back and wait for darkness. As you can see, night has descended upon us, and it's time to search the rainforest for the ghost glass frog. Let's turn our headlamps on and hit the trail. I'm scanning around, I'm listening. I do hear something coming from over here. I think I hear a call. Hear that? It's coming from right up here. Let's check this out. Oh, yep, right there. Look at that. Our first glass frog, cool. Now, first things first, I'm just gonna leave it alone for a second so I get my hands wet. I don't wanna handle a frog with dry hands. Let me see if I can get this frog off its perch. Come here, little guy. Perfect. There we go. Okay. This is not the Elix or the ghost glass frog, but it's actually one of the smallest species of glass frog here in Costa Rica, and it's the Spinosa glass frog otherwise known as the dwarf glass frog. One of the first distinct characteristics you will notice about the glass frog is besides being that really cool translucent green is their eyes are actually set forward as opposed to the side like we'd see in a red eye leaf frog or some of the other frogs that we have here in Costa Rica. And that forward set eye pattern is what gives them that really cool Kermit the Frog look that they're so famous for. I think we've had it off his leaf for long enough. Let's put it back and keep searching. We've got a long night ahead of us if we're gonna find that ghost. We've gone about a kilometer east so far, and we know our final destination or the water source that we're looking for is about three kilometers east. Looks like we need to go a little northeast. Mario, are you seeing that? Yep, according to my compass on my watch, yeah, if we go in this direction, it'll be kind of slightly northeast, and then okay. uh, I think we'll get on that eastern trail as well. It's funny, when you first step foot off trail, there's always this sensation that comes over you. It's just like a heightened awareness. Walking on the trail feels safe, walking off the trail feels hazardous just by nature. So you tend to move a little bit more deliberately and you just, you see more. It's, it's really a, uh, an awesome thing to get off trail. You've got a little bit of groundwater starting here. That means the bigger stream is definitely nearby. Let's head on here and get to the start of the stream. <gasps> Dude, Fertilance. Where? Huge. Let me see. Holy smokes. Look at his head. Whoa! Oh my God. Whew. That is a formidable snake right there. Good spot, Mario. Do you want the snake hook? Uh, no, I don't think we're gonna mess with it. Just gonna get a nice shot of it. So the Fertilance relies on its cryptic coloration to blend into the environment. And an animal in this position could stay in wait for hours without moving a single muscle. The name of the game is waiting when you are an ambush predator. And a snake like this has all the time in the world to wait for an unsuspecting prey item. That is exactly why you have to watch every single step you take out here because your next step could be on something like that fair to lance. And that'd be a very bad day for us. It looks like it's flattening out a little bit, which is good news for us. We can really start looking. I just heard a glass frog, guys, up this way. It's a very quick chirp. It's like a Hear that? Oh, guys, we got one. Yes! Oh man, I knew I heard one. All right, here we go. Hands wet, I'm gonna gently take it off the leaf. I am so excited to show you this frog, and you're going to see why we came all this way to show you the ghost of the rainforest, the ghost glass frog. How cool are those eyes? So cryptic and so unique. In my opinion, 
This frog has the coolest eyes in all of frogs in Central and South America. We're gonna break out the lights, we're gonna break out the macro lens, and we're gonna bring you in close so you can get a good look at why this frog is so special. Mario, you got that macro lens ready to go? Yep, got the lens and the EOS R on the tripod. And I've got the ghost glass frog. Oh, looking right at you. I think it sees its reflection in your lens here and is like, who's that? That looks like me. Hey, buddy. Let me help you there, Mario. Okay, back it up just a little bit right there. Trying to remain as still as I possibly can for Mario's shot right now so everyone at home can see those magnificent eyes. They look cool. Yeah, they're kind of um, reticulated. They got this pattern on them. I'm gonna pause there. Let's try to get a different angle on them. Okay. Just carefully nudge it. This How's way. it doing? Is it doing good? Oh my goodness. That's good. Let's, oh, let's, that's cool let's get right that. There. Let's get its little pads. Yeah. So this species does not have a completely transparent ventrum. However, I could see a little bit of the white sheath of intestinal track inside of its stomach and I could actually see like the beating of the heart. I'm glad you brought that up, Mario, because a lot of people think that all glass frogs have a completely transparent stomach, and that is not true. In fact, it is more of the exception than the rule when that does occur. Now, if you have seen our previous glass frog episode, that was a species with a completely clear ventral side where you could actually see the heart beating and the blood flowing through the frog, which was pretty amazing. Another cool thing, about the ghost glass frog. It is actually the largest species of glass frog in Costa Rica. So kind of fitting that we started tonight with the dwarf glass frog or the spinosa, which is the smallest, and we land on the ghost glass frog, which is the biggest, but still pretty small. It's winking at you. I think he just complimented you, Mario. He's like, wink, that's a great shot. Well, I hope you see now why it was worth the effort to come all the way down here to find the ghost of the rainforest, the ghost glass frog. And I do want to give a special thank you to our friends at B&H Photo for sponsoring this episode and putting together a number of amazing deal packages for everybody at home. So if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave right now, you can take advantage of those exclusive offers. Oh, and don't forget, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss another adventure with me and the crew. I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you next time. All right, let's put this guy back on his leaf and head home. All right, guys, we just got the call. We are on a sea turtle rescue mission, and right now there's a turtle on a beach about 15 miles north from here and needs our help. These sea turtles, when they end up beach, it's because they're distressed and they can no longer swim. And without programs like the one we're participating in, they would all certainly die. So needless to say, this sea turtle right now, its life depends on us. Just this past year alone, more than 850 sea turtles were rescued off the shores of Massachusetts, a number that has been sadly increasing. Endangered sea turtles like the Kemp's Ridley, Green, and Loggerhead are washing up on beaches due to cold stunning, and the changing climate is only making matters worse. I think I see it. Yep, here's our turtle. A volunteer was combing this beach and they discovered this Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And this is exactly what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to take the turtles off of the beach, away from the wind. And then you can see it was covered here with this bit of straw to protect it from exposure. And it does look like we are in time for this sea turtle to have a chance because you can see it still has a little bit of strength in its neck, just enough to pick up its head. And that is a very good sign because most of the turtles that you find that are cold stunned cannot move whatsoever. So let's bundle this little turtle up and take it to the Wellfleet Sanctuary where it will start its process of rehabilitation and hopeful re-release back into the wild. Rapidly fluctuating sea temperatures due to climate change are narrowing the window for these turtles to safely migrate south each year. Rising sea temperatures are holding the turtles in northern waters for too long and any sudden drop in water temperature below 50 degrees results in a mass cold stunning event for these marine reptiles. We have to be super quiet because these turtles are already really stressed and loud noises have been proven to stress them even further. Oh, poor little, poor little turtle. We did notice that it had 
a bit of a response when we picked it up off the beach. Like it, it had some yeah. ability to raise its head. So that's pretty rare, honestly. A lot of the time these turtles are barely moving at all. Sometimes we'll think a turtle's dead and we'll leave it overnight to assess in the morning to make sure that it's still alive. Yeah. Cool. Um, is this our turtle? This is our turtle. All right. How do we know that this turtle isn't dead? So when we first bring it onto this processing table, we will check to see if its flippers are in rigor. Rigor is short for rigor mortis. When an animal dies, it starts to seize up and all of its joints and body parts become stiff. So old. There was slight movement right there. Saw that. Yep, we'll kind of gently tug on their back flippers and then we'll touch their eye for a small eye response as well. And then what we'll do is we will actually use this pit tag scanner here because sometimes these turtles wash in and they have been tagged and no tag was detected here. Then the next thing we'll do is we will take measurements of its carapace. We will look to see if there are any um, injuries on the turtle anywhere, sometimes from pecking from seagulls if they've been sitting on the beach for a while. Um, and then they'll sometimes have some wounds on their carapace. And, and that's why it's so important to get these turtles off the beach yes. as quickly as possible. Each animal receives a number upon entry to the Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. And of the four sea turtles we assisted in rescuing, number 569 was the first to be sent for urgent care. You're on your way, bud. So we quickly mobilized and followed it to the New England Aquarium's Sea Turtle Hospital. Look at all these turtles. Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. Let's go, guys. All right, here we are at the Sea Turtle Hospital. Let's go inside to see our Kemp's Ridley start its rehabilitation process. Come on this way. All right, how's it going, Adam? Thanks Good. for having us. Thank you for coming. So are these our turtles? Is the, that? These are yeah. our turtles, and you have 569, and the camps are very similar looking. And as you'll see, there's a lots of turtles everywhere. And once they get into the water, they look even more similar. So we'll bring them up. We'll put a number on their shell, and we put a band around their flipper. So that way, when we're looking for certain turtles, especially when they're in the water, they'll be easier to find. Awesome. Now we're going to try to listen to see what the heart rate sounds oh, like. cool. And their metabolism at this rate is very slow. Extremely slow. And that's slow. why you need these special instruments to be able to read that. We're listening for the turtle's heartbeat. So far, I just hear static. Oh, I think I just heard a whoosh. So this, this turtle's significantly lower heart rate than it's going to be when it leaves. Exactly, okay. yep. So with that, we will give it a dose of epinephrine that will help get that heart rate a little bit up there and a little bit more prepped for a swim. So this is like the jump start for the rehabilitation process here at the hospital. Once a sea turtle receives epinephrine, it is then placed in a small pool of water for observation. Also called a swim test, this is where the clinical team will look for signs of other damage and possible infections. Let's see how 569 does. So that's a great sign, obviously, that nice little breath there. And turtle's going into the water. And so, yeah, I mean, he's ready to go. That. For these turtles, freshwater is important because of the dehydration piece. Mm. Helps rehydrate them. One or two days in that fresh water won't be detrimental, and then they're into the full salt water tanks. These turtles have been out there breathing in cold air, water, so we see a lot of pneumonia. So you can kind of see it's slowing down a little bit there. Okay. We also Buddy. see how high in the water he is, so he's, he's definitely got some gas in his system there that's keeping him very floaty. As you can see, and he has some odd coloration in those front flippers, so he may have some skin issues that over the next few days as he warms up, might become a little bit more prevalent. So I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Adam, but in your professional experience, how would you say our turtle here, number 569, is looking in terms of its potential for rehabilitation? Yeah, no, the prognosis for this turtle at this point would be good. I saw some bubbles coming out of the, okay. the ears, the nose. Then you saw him lift his head and took a nice breath. So that's all great things. Love it. That is so great to hear. And it's so nice to see the turtle lively again. I feel like most people who would encounter one of these cold stun turtles on the beach might even think they were already dead. But sure enough, here at the hospital, after a little shot of epinephrine and a chance to swim, we've got a lot of movement. All right, so now that our turtle has swam for the first time at the hospital, part of the rehabilitation process of warming them back up to the appropriate temperature, which is about 72 degrees, takes a few days. After treating nearly 5,000 turtles, this facility has learned quite a bit about how to bring the temperature back up in the appropriate way. And the best way they found to do it is a stage process over days using multiple tanks. Over the next two days, they will actually be placed in the saltwater baths that will raise them up to about 65 degrees and then eventually up to the 72 degrees that you'll see here in the holding tanks. 
these turtles here, they're already being raised up to temperature. Pretty cool and definitely something that really helps these turtles stand a chance of being re-released. Along with being critically endangered, the Kemp's Ridley is also the rarest sea turtle on the planet. Once abundant, their population suffered a massive crash in the 1980s, where as few as 250 nesting females were estimated to remain. Luckily for the world's smallest and rarest sea turtle, large-scale conservation efforts helped restore their population to stability by the mid-2000s. However, with current climate trends being as they are, the pressure is now back on to save this species from extinction. I've heard reports that the Kemp's Ridley are somewhere in the population of 30 to 40,000 individuals in the world. Is that is that what you've heard also? They are a critically endangered population. So, I mean, the fact that you're seeing thousands of turtles come to the facility, this is a, a significant mass yes. of this species. They're getting these guys through and back into the ocean is critical. Well, this is not the end of the road for the video, guys. We actually have one more step that we want to show you as part of this turtle rehabilitation program. This one, though, is going to take us on a short trip to the airport. So as you can see, we are no longer in the Sea Turtle Hospital. We are in an air hangar because there's an amazing volunteer program called Turtles Fly 2 that takes these sea turtles down to warmer waters in the southern United States where they will finish their rehabilitation and be released back into the wild much sooner than Mother Nature would allow here in New England. And we just got word that the turtles will arrive, so it's time to get to work and load up these sea turtles. All right, so you have a van load and a truck load full of sea turtles that are being loaded up by volunteers and aquarium staff onto this aircraft right now. They're trying to set a record today by loading 100 sea turtles onto this airplane. That's a lot of reptiles. So right now the pilot and the co-pilot are up there playing a little bit of turtle Tetris to try to get all of these animals loaded up onto this aircraft. It takes a lot of resources to fly these turtles, so they wanna make sure every flight is efficient and as productive as they can. Trying to get one more up there? Yeah, I think they have a little shirt of banana hunt. Okay. Nice. Oh, there's more turtles. <laughs> there's always more turtles. <laughs> Last one. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. Got the, uh, the final turtle box to load into the aircraft. Last one. Something I never thought I would say. Turtles on an airplane. But here in New England, it happens about a dozen times a year. That's cool. The turtles that make the flight to Florida are the ones ready to be released back into the wild. But others needing more long-term rehabilitation, like our friend 569, will continue to receive care at the Sea Turtle Hospital until they are ready to be released when spring returns to New England. Researchers have predicted that by 2031, just eight years from this video's release, thousands of cold stunned sea turtles will wash up on New England shores every single year. It takes an amazing collaboration to combat these events and return healthy sea turtles into the ocean to rejoin their populations. From emergency veterinarians, to airplane pilots, to hundreds of beachcombing volunteers, I was so proud to play a small part in saving these rare and endangered animals. But the work continues every single day from the cold shores of Cape Cod to the warm waters of South Florida. And these wildlife heroes need our support. Please join Brave Wilderness in the New England Aquarium by clicking the link in the description to donate, spread awareness, or perhaps volunteer yourself in the effort to save these beloved treasures of our oceans.